All right. Hello and welcome to another episode of Music, Philosophy and More. I'm your host, John Henry Sheridan. And today I have a very special guest with me, Amy Levin. Thank you for being on the show, Amy. Oh, you're welcome. Enjoying it. I'm trying to find where you are live on Facebook. Yeah, it, it is about a five or six second delay. So oh, it should okay. pop up in a little bit. Um, yeah, okay. I just see it. Yeah, so I just pop up if you find if you go to John Henry Sheridan uh, profile page. Yeah, I am on your page. And just uh, what's it called? Refresh it, maybe. Yeah, I just refresh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's live here. It might take take a few moments there. Uh, actually, I could share it directly to your page. Let me try that. Okay, let's do that. Yeah. All right, share, share now, okay. Share to a friend's profile. And uh, yeah, it should pop up. All right, so. Ah, here we go. Okay, so I'm just uh, gonna keep the dialogue going so we don't have dead air. Um, so yeah, we're starting a few minutes early, everybody, just so uh, we could set up and get the show shared onto Amy's page so her uh, friends and audience can easily find her. Thanks, John. Sure, absolutely. So uh, yeah, welcome to the show, Amy. Ah, it's great. It's good to see you. Yeah, I know. We So Amy and I have been in a, in a book uh, group for the past... Uh, 10 weeks, so this would be the 11th week, and today there was no class, so I'm sure all of us in the group felt that today was a little different, right? I did. I was not sure what to do with myself, and <laughs> said, ah, I'll prepare for tonight. <laughs> Excellent. Great. So, yeah, it was it was a pleasure. Um, we did this course called uh, Book um, Doula's Incubator Program with Christine Carlson and Deborah Evans, and they helped us uh, in the program to figure out the books we're writing and how to write. And le we learned a lot. And we also made a lot of friends, wouldn't you say? We did. Yes, we did. We did. And it was great getting to know you and everything that you're doing. And I thought it'd be a great opportunity for us to share our experiences in music. And I'm in expressive therapy. So, and it was great. Yes. I, uh, Join because I'm writing a book and beginning to write a book. And I experienced the loss of my son, Jonathan, uh, about 29 years ago. He was six. He died of leukemia. Wow. And so I am, I joined the book doulas to write about how I got through it. And I wanted to share it with everyone. And so. Wow. So, so that, that's the main theme. It's, it's, it's like a healing journey type of book. Yeah. Yeah. It's a healing journey, but it's also motivational. Mm -hmm. um, not sure of the title yet, but it's about going from grief to joy and, and love self-love. Wow. And so, yeah, it's more of a, a teaching memoir. Mm -hmm. Wow. Which we, were you aware of the, uh, teaching memoir genre before our, our class because I wasn't I had no idea <laughs> I had no idea what I was going to do what I was going to write but they were they're wonderful yeah they were great and that we also know each other we don't know each other through this but we both also partake in Lee Harris energy and that's how we both got to the book doulas right exactly which is yeah. uh yeah, he's definitely worth mentioning. Uh, I feel um, in some way uh, that he's definitely an inspiration to, to all of us. And in some way, I feel like he's a role model for me and what kind of direction I may be going. Not that I'll be necessarily an energy healer or uh, what's the word? Um, uh, channel or whatever it is that he channels. Uh, but um, I don't know. I just feel like he provides space for people to be creative and encouraging, encourages them. He's a dual of sorts, right? And he, yeah. he helps people find their, their energy and gives birth. Like I took the rebirth program 2021. Did you take that one? I did do. I, I took that naturally. 
that's how I found the book doulas because I had posted on that site, on that Facebook page, Rebirth 2021. Hey, I'm ready to need a mentor. Who do you recommend? And it was wow. Allie, who was also in our class from Rebirth 21, who said, try the book doulas. So um, and I'll come, yeah, I he actually helped me in creativity through the other programs, transmission or um, intuition. And mm -hmm. so I've done a couple of, it really helped me start this process. Awesome. This program, so. so I just want to shout out to Haley Sage, our, uh, our book doula friend hey. uh, who's, who's watching, giving us high fives. Hey, Haley. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks for joining Haley. <clears throat> and yeah. shout out to Joseph Walsh. Um, so uh, let's get into it. So um, Amy, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? You already did, thank you. Um, anything else you'd like to add? Like, where did you grow up? Where'd you live now? Anything in between? Sure. Yeah, I grew up in Nor Norwich, Connecticut. And I'm a New Englander. Mm -hmm. And I've lived in Western Mass for over, over 30 years. And then the past five years, I went to get my master's in expressive arts and traveled back and forth to Cambridge. And then finally, I slowly moved to Boston for my internship. And I ended up getting a job in uh, Boston in Dedham. And worked there for a few years with Alzheimer's and decided eh, it's time to kind of semi-retire and I wanted to be by the ocean. So I moved to Rhode Island and I'm in my happy place. I have wow. my cup, the beach <laughs> cup. <laughs> Great. So, so and, uh, what was the first place you came from? Did you say Connecticut? Yeah, Norwich. Okay, Connecticut, yeah. Connecticut to... Uh, Western um, Mass. To, to, yeah, Massachusetts. And then yeah. now to uh, Rhode Island. Yep. Yeah, that's and awesome. Awesome. And uh, three boys. Wow. And uh, 30, 27. And then my son, um, you know, probably talked about it before some of you were on, but I had a son who passed away uh, 29 years ago, Jonathan, the age of six. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I, I, and I, what I want to share with everyone is in my book, that's how we met at the book doers with John, um, is he's given me many gifts. And, they, and basically I was thinking about it today and I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for him because as he was going through his illness, he made up a story about a bird and it helped him so much that I started writing and taking classes that I'd get it published, didn't. But if I never started writing, I would probably never have been in the book doulas, never been here with you. So I thank mm -hmm. Jonathan. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Jonathan. Yep. Yeah, I, I can't help but think of Jonathan Livingston Seagull. I get the image yes. of the bird flying free. Yes. Yep. Uh, Ooh, yeah. I, I mean, my heart uh, definitely goes out to you. My son is about to turn six in July. So the thought of losing him is totally yeah. heartbreaking. And we did, my wife and I had a stillbirth. So we did oh. go through carrying a child the whole time. And and his his name was Corazon. That was 2011. And Corazon means heart in uh, Portuguese. Oh, beautiful. We were volunteers in Brazil. So a lot of what we do now is really heart-based. And uh, yo, my wife does something called Corazon Talks where she does Facebook Live in Japanese for her. So, you know, yeah. our, our children live through us. They live they on, do. you know, for sure. Yeah. So uh, let's see. Um, so I understand you have a master's in expressive arts from yep. Leslie University, Cambridge. Yep. So can you explain? I, I got a bit of an idea through reading uh, what you shared with me, but um, what is expressive arts? I think many people may not be so familiar with it. Yeah, expressive arts is a combination of a lot of little, a uh, lot of different genres of arts, drama, uh, visual arts, music, movement, dance movement therapy, psychodrama, and poetry, and combining all of these arts together. It's, a, it's also a client-centered. I believe in the Carl Rogers, that the client, I go with where the client is, or the Jungian theory. And sometimes if the client is uncomfortable in speaking, it helps them, we can bring out a tool of art, or they can play with Play-Doh, or where they, that's for the younger kids, um, or movement. And it's bringing in 
a tool for them to use in music. So example, I have done in working with the Alzheimer's population, I've done music with them where we did a movement with Tchaikovsky of the Waltz of the Flowers. Mm -hmm. And I would, it took them a while. It took them quite a while. I started very slow with them, but I would move my arms to the music with them mm -hmm. and help them with anticipation when it started going louder. And it's sort of, you can see in my body where you can be in and when you can open. So we talk about the feeling of being in, what does that feel like? And then when the music gets louder, we open up and we express. And mm -hmm. we use the music as a guide for that movement, dance movement therapy and how we feel in ourselves. And, but it's also about mirroring. Mm -hmm. And it gives them joy. Basically working with them, my philosophy is giving them a lot of joy. And I also did a art program with them where I would, I had printed out very famous pictures like the Mona Lisa, and there were some other ones and we would compare. Mm -hmm. you know, just getting to see what's the difference in the light. And then we would um, have them paint with music, just what's the music and have it go through them. So they would take their paint, see if they can listen to the music and doing that. Um, so it's a lot of different things to help them express, help them to, if they see something, they see what they've done, then it really... I exist. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of us want to be seen. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And sometimes that have that, you know, they need to be seen no matter where they are, or what they're doing. I did, um, oh, what was the song? Uh, I can't think of it now. But we did movement to one of the Broadway shows. Mm -hmm. And singing, we were outside and we would, they would know when to put their arm up and when to put their down. So it was a lot of different movement with music. Um, and I also did poetry with them. So we bring in poetry. I did Robert Frost in the mm -hmm. forest out in the woods. And I would put it up on the screen and we would talk about it. And we would, then I would say a word, see if they could, some of them could. They were at a little higher level so they could say words of what they remembered. I would have the words printed and see what they said if there was a word that they liked. And we made up our own poem, create a poem. Oh. Um, and you can also expand it. You can do reading, poetry, and in a different type of groups, you can then have them make their own poem. So if it's not Alzheimer's, but it's working with a client one-on-one, -on -one, you could have them look at a poem, see what the words they, that are important to them in that poem, and then they could write their own. Wow. And then they can paint a picture for it. So they could create their own poem and then make a picture for it. And you know, a lot of clients are uncomfortable in movement, but then they can move to it as well. So that's expressive arts. It's really combining a lot of different genres. And it depends on the client, what works with the client. Um, I also once worked with, um, clients who were distressed and depressed and I did a meditation with them and then after meditation I put on music and this one fellow ended up drawing a tree from the music mm -hmm. and he realized that he was supported by his family so yeah. it's really um, yeah, that's so basically expressive arts is what it sounds like. It, it's yes. all the arts that help us to express ourselves. Right. Yeah, I, I can see why that's such a uh, valuable um, uh, resource or, or therapeutic approach, uh, <clears throat> especially with populations who don't uh, know how to express or individuals who don't have that nature. It's not in their inherent to express naturally to help mm -hmm. them pull it out of them, you know, like you were saying. Uh, so I think you kind of answered this, but if there's anything you'd like to add, how important is it to attune with the individuals that you're conducting a therapy session with, like to spend time to like connect yeah. with those people? Yeah, well, I know I would like to add because when you say attuned for me, especially working with that population, I focus on vibration. 
I can mm -hmm. sense their energy. And I believe that what we bring, if we bring in love and light to them, they'll then respond. And there was a woman who I worked um, when I lived in Western Mass in Longmeadow and a nursing home. And she was, she was at the later stages. And I brought her into the sunshine and I could just see connecting with her that she loved the sunshine. And I was reading a Robert Frost book on the seasons. And when it hit summer, I could see her eyes just lift. Mm -hmm. So it was being that in tune and watching that very specific that I could tell in just a little bit mm -hmm. um, and knowing, and I said, you're here and you enjoy this. And I could see her eyes lifting again. So mm -hmm. that's the key. Wow. Yeah, I, I have had, uh, it reminded me when I was reading through some of your material and as we speak, uh, I had one, I had a few experiences uh, with um, interacting with people with Alzheimer's, not, not like family members, people I didn't know so closely. And then one time a friend of mine invited me to take over for an Alzheimer's group that he was doing like music therapy with. And I went down and I checked it out. Um, it wasn't really for me at the time, but I got a chance to see what he does. He did. Uh, and yeah, amazing. Like a ton of patience it required. And right. uh, this like, you have to kind of, my sense of it, you have to really melt the ice or break the ice every single time, probably, you know, because yeah. they're in this collective group and to warm them up uh, and then to respond to each individual's needs because they're all in their own space. They do need, but also they need that right. distance yeah. too, you know? So, so I can relate to how much heart you must have uh, I, I also think of uh, what's the other very common. Uh, I also think of uh, autism too. I've interacted yeah. with some autistic uh, individuals too, and I know how it's it's a little bit similar to the Alzheimer's in the, in the sense of that distance that uh, is yeah. uh, challenging to breach. You know, to make the connection. Um, had you, have you also worked with all, or, I autism? did, I, I worked with also, um, autistic children. I worked with special ed. I, uh, you mm -hmm. would think that I love learning, but I do have a master's in special ed, but it wasn't until later in life that I learned finally how to learn. <laughs> mm -hmm. right. So now I love it. Um, but yes, I've worked with special ed and, um, autistic children and, um, yeah, one of my experiences in working with children, I did do a music therapy program with a child who had blindness. And he, uh, five years old, he said the word no. And they felt that they weren't sure if he could hear. And in my intuition, it was like, he says that really clear. So I developed a music therapy session with him. And everything we did, we sang. Song about, oh, where, where's your bus driver? Let's swing on the swing today. It was all the same song, all the same rhythm. I did a lot of texture with him to sort of want to wake him up. But it was really in tune to really sense who he was, what songs we were. And it was a utopia situation. There was two of us and only three children because they were phasing out the program. So I could give him that. We could give him that one-on-one, -on -one, the woman I was working with. And... Um, in six months and every time for lunch, we would give him a break. We would put on Sesame Street song, plug for Sesame Street. And <laughs> he started singing in perfect pitch. Somebody come out and play today. Wow. He never mm -hmm. said, a, said a, any other word, but no, until wow. this moment. And so then we started doing words and I actually ended up going back and meeting with him and his family when I was getting my master's and he was just talking a blue streak. So wow. music works, music therapy. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's so fascinating to me because <clears throat> as a musician, as a composer, as a performer, like I'm just teacher, I'm saturated with music. So sometimes it, it's all like, it's, it, all, it becomes meaningless sometimes because I'm so in it that when I see the effect it has on someone who's not in it all the time, I'm like, oh yeah, wow. That, that's why I got into it. You know, I, I, I could forget. Uh, you become numb to it a little bit, you know, but um, yeah, it, it's, it's, really, uh, it's really something. <laughs> it is, you know, when you were talking before and then it's coming back when working with Alzheimer's, it's all the same thing about being attuned. 
Be, and I think the important thing is being attuned to the environment. Mm -hmm. So I, when I worked with them, I was able to walk in and I was planning on doing something very upbeat at this one time. And I walked in and there was a sense of a heavy, heavy environment. It just felt very stressed. And I mentioned something. There was one fellow who's a little bit higher level. And I said, wow, what's going on here? He said, can you feel it? I said, yeah. I said, what do you think you need? He said, we need to get rid of this, whatever. You know, he couldn't say what it was. So mm -hmm. I did a mindfulness uh, meditation with them with really uh, quiet music. I did the rain stick. And we did this for about 20 minutes. And then slowly I had to bring them back. <laughs> so mm -hmm. they wouldn't be sleeping before lunch. And I asked, how are you now? And this one woman said, I'm happy now. <laughs> so Good. it's really, so that's the attunement when you're sensing the environment and one or two people um, to be able to go in and, and, and adjust yeah, harmonize, it. Yeah, yeah. harmonize it yeah harmonize it harmonize yeah 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 so it's like uh being a teacher in a, a public school classroom or any classroom really right that that's yeah. is part and, of it and too. with a client yeah when a client comes in sensing their mood sensing where they're at mm -hmm. so this way you can because it is a service right that you're providing so right right it's all the more <clears throat> valuable when uh, someone feels that they're really being not only listened to but um seen you know yeah. where, where they're at which is yeah this is all energy work right i guess which is why yeah. we're attracted That's, to lee harris so much right yeah the subtleties yeah, and i was very much into that i would go into that was my focus when i worked with this assisted living is bringing love and light mm -hmm. i was even before I even connected lee and six months later, my supervisor says, oh, my gosh, you brought so much light in here and love. And I went, yes, I accomplished. I didn't know, but I kind of sensed. But yeah, so when I discovered Lee Harris, it was yeah, right up my alley. Cool. Well, I have to ask you this question. It's a little a different direction. Uh, All right. But I'm just curious about this ballroom dancing. You actually <laughs> uh, competing in ballroom dancing for everything a little years? lighter. Like, yeah. Yes, I did. Um, wow. I competed in, I did, well, I, I did. I did ballroom dancing first, but some reason this is coming to my mind. I did figure skating first for yeah. about six years. And then I stopped and I thought, all right, I want to look into something else. So I did. I did ballroom dance competition for about 15 years. And I felt that the only way I learn is to have a goal. Mm -hmm. um, I used to play in a tennis league and drop that. So never play tennis again. So when I walked in, I said, yep, put me on competition. I went to my first competition two months after I started mm -hmm. and loved it. Loved yeah. it. Um, the first time I was on the floor, I was in tears because I couldn't believe I was there. My mother right. used to do ballroom dancing oh, really? and she had passed. So mm -hmm. um yeah, so it's like, come on, mom, going on the floor. <laughs> oh, that's great. Yeah. And roughly, um, yeah. what, like, what what period of your life did you start that? Uh, was I in my fifties? Oh, yeah. really? you started at that time. Yep. Yep. Oh yeah. man, <laughs> and um, competed. That's actually, great. I stopped. It was yeah, I just stopped it about three years ago. Okay. When I was going to getting for my master's, it just was a little bit. It was too much. Or four years ago. So, um, yeah, I went all the way up. I reached my goal to go into the gold level. I went to a, world, a ballroom dance a world championship held in Columbus, Ohio. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so who knows why it's there as a world championship. And I, from my level of the bronze and my age, I came in first in the waltz and the foxtrot. So. Wow, that's great. <laughs> and, uh, and I used my video of that to enter into Leslie, they accepted that, so. Oh, is it so an expressive arts thing? Mm -hmm. It is, yes, it is. Yeah, it is an expressive course, arts yeah. And dance, yeah. yeah. Wow. Very interesting, and that's definitely inspiring. Like, when I was reading it, I pictured maybe when you were 
20 years old or 15, maybe you started ballroom dancing and you competed. Yeah. Uh, but they, they, you started later in life is really yeah. Uh, inspiring. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cool. And uh, all right. <clears throat> so, oh, yeah. So it, you didn't mention it, but out of curiosity, if you're willing to talk about it, what did you do before you got into expressive arts and dancing? Was it not creative? Uh, no. It was you know, I think my life was always creative in a way. Well, I, I taught special ed for a while mm -hmm. um, and then married, stayed home. But then I was exploring before I went to expressive arts. I actually went to um, Federation of Children with Special Needs. I became an advocate um, and did that for a while and worked special ed. I also became a personal trainer. <laughs> a friend of mine was leading this group, uh, FIT. Go fit. And it was work with underprivileged youth and women. And I volunteered and she said, Oh my gosh, you're great with the population. I want you to come and lead the groups. And I said, Well, if I'm going to do that, then I should become a personal trainer. So <laughs> I did through the National Academy of Sports Medicine, became a personal trainer. <laughs> um, and then I got into the Nia technique, which is the mind body movement. And I taught that for a while. Hmm. Oh. Uh, certainly an adventurous life. Yes. So I, I hope in your book you encapsulate uh, the uh, roller coaster, but also just the adventure that your life has been, exploration. Yeah, but that's also later. That was also after Jonathan passed, after I took a meditation course and I started writing about this, that one meditation course said, what do you love? What do you like? What do you love? Well, you know, family came, but all I could think of were sunsets. And I realized that my grief was so much that I didn't know. And then I, from that meditation class, I went and it's like, well, what do I like? And now it's almost like I'm eager to learn. I love learning. And the meditation really helped me open up to see that what life has to offer. And that's also... Um, Wow, you, you definitely have a very youthful spirit. And I think I would attribute a lot of that is probably because of your love for learning, which keeps, I imagine, keeps us young yeah. <clears throat> and whatever other attributes you have. But that certainly must play a part in it, because when we cut off and say, I know it all. Right. Then, then we start. Then the aging process really kicks in, I think, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was, I'm, I'm chuckling because my friends always say, what is Amy up to now? <laughs> yeah that's great because i'm always into something <clears throat> different, something different. And yeah 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 um i was gonna say uh well yeah beginner beginner's mind jumps out if you right. it's like a zen concept like yeah. that that empty mind is the best way to really to go about life because then you're always yeah. will able to learn but if you think you know like as a guitarist i was even a guitar teacher i felt that if I could have beginner's mind or humility, even though I'm like, you know, I've done it so many times that I have a certain level of expertise or whatever, <clears throat> that that attitude doesn't serve me to, to feel like I'm, I'm really great and it doesn't help anything. So to think that there's always much more to learn that I'm, all, I'm just on a growth curve that's all my own, that's irrelevant to everyone else, you know, that, that always, I felt, you know, that, that helps. And you said that, that you learned how to learn later in life, uh, kind of in passing uh, as a joke. But right. uh, I think that's, you know, my son being five, we're homeschooling him. I think that's really my focus. And I, and I wish it was more of a focus for most schools to just teach kids how to learn. Because especially things are changing real fast. So who knows in a couple of years how different things will be from what they've learned in school already. So knowing how to learn will be the most useful than actually just learning knowledge or facts or anything, you know, that's what I feel. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah. I did that in college. That was my junior year in college when I finally figured it out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, at least you figured it out, right? <laughs> I did. Right. Yeah. Uh, so let's see. Um, so you did share with me an incredible story about a Mahler concert and how it was a beautiful, amazing healing experience. If you, if you wouldn't mind, would you sure. tell that sure. story? Yeah, um, this was two years after uh, Jonathan passed, and 
I went to Tanglewood. It was up in Western Mass, it's in the Berkshires. We have to be sitting in, inside. And Mahler was, was the, uh, and playing. And this was after a few months, maybe it was about a year after I started meditation class. And I thought, you know what, let me do a meditation, see if I can feel the music more. And it happened to be at symphony number no. four and have to be on the third movement. And it was the beginning. I said, oh, finally, you know, let go of all the stress, let go of the, the, the depression and the sadness because the, the music was very, the, the violins, maybe and I recently started playing the violin a year ago. <laughs> so maybe wow. this started it. And I just was like on a cloud, but then the music changed and adult. And it actually brought me through the Mahler and I wrote about it piece by piece, the sound. I worked with the musician about where I heard the music and the sound and wrote about my experience of letting go of him. And in the beginning, this is for people who are watching, it's hard because I had to let go of him in the light, but I was in the darkness. Mm -hmm. And I remember that. And it brought me through the darkness, it brought me through letting go. And finally, in my mind's eye, it's all still in meditation, sitting there, I'm quiet and I really feel like I heard Jonathan's voice. And the music was very soft too. I remember writing about this. So it was like, oh, they're listening. Mahler's mm -hmm. listening. <laughs> and then I was encouraged to stand and look up and there was a rainbow coming down surrounding me. And he had a blue, light blue aura and I had a blue aura and in my meditation, my mindfulness, we were dancing together. Mm -hmm. And it was incredible to be with him. And then it ended and I'm thinking, was this real? Did I make it up? I really felt it. And then years later, I got a CD and it had Ben Zander, who is a conductor in Boston. And um, mm -hmm. it had a commentary on it. Let's see if I have it, I can read it exactly. And let's see, where is it? Oh, and the commentary said, Mahler's intention for the third movement is about letting go of death accepting and opening the gates of heaven and feeling a truth meaning of its abundance. So I thought, oh my God, <laughs> I did that. Yeah, that sounds like, that, that sounds actually like, like you said that Mahler was there too. Mahler right? was that there, was, oh yeah. Mahler. No, the music, Mahler, apps, I'm getting the chills now, brought me through this experience of healing. Wow. <laughs> it was just, I'm sitting there with tears, I'm like, yeah, he's walking by, but I wasn't still there. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it was an it was an incredible. And actually, I sent it to Ben Zander. Oh, right. <laughs> and I met with him, and we didn't have a private talk, but he was like, "Oh my gosh, that's amazing! Thank you for sharing with me." And he gave me free tickets to the concert. Wow, <laughs> so. that's fantastic. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I I believe it. I mean, it, it doesn't matter to me what's factual about that or not, it's very real to you. And uh, I, I've had s experiences that are similar enough in nature to, to give me no reason to doubt your experience, you know? And I'm curious, was your son um, the age, was he six when you saw him or was he kind of like a, a nondescript age? It was not, him? it was, I didn't really see him, but I could feel him. Right, right. I could feel his aura, I could feel him in our imaginations, our, our auras were, we're dancing. It was just his essence of who mm -hmm. he is, who he right. was. So beyond age. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It wasn't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I was That's... in the beginning of the meditation, maybe now after working with Lee's intuition and opening up my soul, who knows? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. Um, yeah. That's a great story. Thank you so much for sharing it. I think a lot of people will uh, benefit from hearing it, you know, I really do. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I'd like to ask you, do you have a 
spiritual philosophy that guides you, uh, if, if it's a religion, whatever it is, uh, or something that informs how you live, like when things start going awry, you, you mentioned meditation. What's yeah. kind of your main philosophy, um, if you care to share? Well, actually, it's a combination. I, um, well, one, one day at a time, one moment at a time, being in the moment, it's always sometimes it's hard for me to do that. And to allow the, just take a breath. A lot of times if I'm feeling anxious, just like take a breath mm -hmm. and to let be and to let allow. Um, but what's really helped me through a lot of changes, I actually, my biggest, one of my biggest stress besides Jonathan and divorce and things, I was, um, when I was going to Leslie, um, before I was doing an internship in, in with literally five months, I was looking for an internship. I was in Western Mouse, painting my house, getting my house ready to sell, mm. packing up, getting things together, neatening up, then, coming to looking for a place to live, looking for an internship, then selling the house, packing up, getting rid of all the junk. Anyway, da 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 da, -da. Mm -hmm. Moving. Oh, man. At the same time, starting a new internship. And they say one thing is a big deal. And <laughs> I did like tons. And <laughs> I was stressed. So stressed that when my social worker who I was working with said, oh, by the way, I'm leaving. And it took me months to find that, Leslie, you have to have a social worker as part of the program. And it's really hard to find that. Mm -hmm. And she says, I'm leaving. I just kind of went. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, my God, I couldn't hold it together. Anyway, it was fine. I didn't uh, deal with it. But I went and took a mindfulness-based stress reduction course um, that John Cabot's in. Um, mm -hmm. I was, I heard about it in night when he started it in 76, 75. And I went, Ooh, someday I want to go. And when I lived in, I lived in Worcester for a time, it was literally 15 minutes from my house. So I took advantage of that. Wow. And that mm -hmm. was really what helped me. I took, and that got me more into my meditation practice. I, that was, I think maybe four years ago. And I've been almost doing meditation every day. Wow. Um, and oh, that God. really helped me regulate. And then I went into and took a course in the mindfulness um, self-compassion workshop, which was in Cambridge. So living in Boston was an advantage for me. I started taking mm -hmm. advantage of things. And that was started by Kristen Neff and Chris Germer in the self-compassion. <laughs> And that actually helped me get to where I am in writing my book because I had a big journal that I wrote about Jonathan, about 135 pages. But as I would read things that were really you know, triggering, I would use the mindfulness self-compassion tools. You know, I would feel like, oh my gosh, is it gonna last all day in this trigger? But using the tools, I was able to move out of it within like 20 minutes. Wow. So I use a lot of those. Um, so you sorry, you said John Kabat-Zinn, that's a, is he Zen? I think I, I'm familiar with him. Uh, Z-I-N-N. He's um, started the Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction Program, mm -hmm. which he started he a, it in a Is he a Zen monk? I, I felt like he was. No, huh? no. He's like his non-affiliated non or something? Right. As far okay. as I know, as far as I know. And uh, is, is he uh, also one of these people who speaks about hospice? I feel like I might have heard him in that context. That like, I don't uh, know. Compassion that for I the dying know. type of thing. I mean, yes. I mean, probably. But I, the main part that he started it was at UMass Medical School for medical issues. Okay. That's where he basically started. So I don't know about the hospice, but it was basically he started in the basement. Mm -hmm. of the UMass Medical School in Worcester. Mm -hmm. And now it's grown. And there's also a program that so there is still one at UMass in um, Worcester, Shrewsbury, um, but now there's also one at Brown. Mm -hmm. And um, so 
going to talk about this later, but there is free mindfulness-based stress reduction program through the Brown Mindfulness every day. Okay. So, so yeah, I, I, I want to put some links uh, for the things you mentioned. So John Kabat-Zinn Meditation. Uh, and what is this program? Uh, so I could put a link to it. Oh, uh, Brown. It's the mindfulness program at Brown University okay. in Providence. All right. Uh, my Brown Mindfulness Program. Yes. In and then, and then there's the um, mindfulness self compassion. So I combine. Like, what do I need today? Mm -hmm. Mindfulness self compassion was that. Those other two guys you mentioned? That was uh, Chris, uh, Christine Neff, that's N E F F, and Chris Germer. Christine Neff and Chris yeah. Germer? Yeah. Okay, I'll just put links for people who want to dive a little deeper with that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so you mentioned Worcester. Um, my wife and I met in, um, in the Berkshires um, when we were oh. preparing for this uh, volunteer program in Brazil. It was a Massachusetts campus where we trained. And then, uh, so we, we did fundraising and we were on the road in New England for, for a few wow. weeks, uh, standing in front of uh, shop rights and places like that saying, hey, would you like to uh, help a bunch of volunteers go to Brazil to, to help uh, people in poverty? And a lot of people helped, but a lot of people are like, hey, this, we're in a recession, why don't you help people here? You know, it's like, well, because there are people there too, and we want to try. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, oh, yeah, that's we, great. We made it through. But yeah, we have, I have memories in Worcester, I have memories in Gloucester. And in Boston, I think Yoko and I had our first date, technically. I think our only date until later, after we got married, we had a few more dates, but um, because we lived together through this program, so there's no yeah. need for dates. Um, anyway, I just thought I'd mention that. That's good. Now, uh, where were you in the Berkshires? Uh, Williamstown. Oh, way up there. Yeah, right. Yeah. By five corners. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. It, yeah, it was, we didn't uh, live that far. I lived about an hour away from Berkshires. Oh, yeah. When I lived in Western Mass, Long Meadow. Yeah. That's a so. gorgeous country. I, I flew there in the autumn. That was so fortunate. Yeah. Oh, it's beautiful. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, um, so let's see. Uh, so you don't have a particular religion that you follow. This is more based on the mindfulness. And well, the I'm. Well, it is more mindfulness, but I also did just start taking Kabbalah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Kabbalah philosophy, which is like, you know, it's almost like they're all the same. Like Lee Harris energy, bring connecting with the soul. I mean, that's I think mm -hmm. basically becoming my where I where I go. Bringing in the light mm -hmm. is. The Kabbalah philosophy is connect me to the light. When there's stress, um, the first thing that they taught us was pause. What a pleasure. Mm -hmm. It was seeing the positive, seeing, you know, take a break. Um, and then, and how to connect with people in the light, being with the light with each one. And so, and seeing their goodness. So, um, and I'm just starting to do that and um and lee's energy of being in the light um but also i am being a learner <laughs> i do a lot of meditation courses online mm -hmm. uh, rick hansen is one of the ones that i go to a lot he does a free uh meditation wednesday nights mm -hmm. okay nine o'clock half the time i'm fallen asleep but I like the discussion afterwards and then Tara Brock does her program also on Wednesday nights at seven um, and she does something on Saturday afternoon which is open discussion um, wow. yeah so that's and I've done his couple of his courses and so I go from him to Lee to Tara Cool, cool. And you you find you know you find what you need wherever you go, right? You right, and it depends need. on the moment. I don't I don't stay with one particular aspect mm -hmm. um, in my meditation. Sure. And uh, sometimes I just I do a silent meditation uh, sometimes, but I have so many different things at my fingertips, and I think that's what's important. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, you have a toolbox. A tool I have kit. a toolbox. Yeah, I um, I think there was a there were errors in human history when er, errors not errors errors when it was important for people to be one thing and focus on that one path and you know I'm sure that exists still, but now we're also in uh, an era of where so much is merging, so many paths are merging. So now I think it's also this new opportunity to actually merge with several different streams take what what really resonates and what does feel like it's enlightening us and and enlivening us and uh you know giving credit to where it's due and you know acknowledging it and being grateful for it and yeah i think having this diverse spiritual path is also uh as valid as anything else you know i i well, I'm, of course i mean who's to say what's valid or what's not right. but I think it's, it, it can be as intense as anything else, you know, as the one path too, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah you I, know, just, I could, I, I've just been reading Thomas Merton, right? Uh, do you know, are you familiar with him? So mm -hmm. he was a, he was a Catholic monk, a uh, Cistercian monk who, Trappist, sorry, Trappist monk, who um, born 1905 or something like that. And then or 1915 died 1960s but he was like his parents died when he was young and then his brother died in the war so he was like a, a symbol of the chaos of the 20th century and then he just he was you know had sold wild oats when he was young and then he decided he needed to find a home because he was kind of homeless in a sense he had nowhere to go and he be decided being a monk he became catholic he wasn't born catholic he he uh converted to Catholicism and then he became a monk and somehow he was able to uh, have a, a career as an author even as a monk they allowed him to do wow. that they saw that that this would be right for him and it would be it would help the Catholic Church in a way too and so he wrote tons of material and he's very much about the one path for him he it's being a monk but he also was beginning to see that if there was going to be peace on earth in the 20th century we're going to have to harmonize with the East, you know, being he was living in America. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to harmonize with the Orient and learn from their wisdom. Uh, so, yeah, someone like that was important. You know, Dalai Lama has, is, is one religion, right? Um, <clears throat> and he's peace act. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually a Nichiren Buddhist, so I'm, I'm, I am my religion, but I also very much uh, take from the wisdom of all traditions and, and seek to find the common ground and speak to that light. Like you're saying, Kabbalah, find the light in the other person, speak to that, you know? Um, yeah. I don't know. Just kind of riffing here. Yeah. 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 Sounds good. Sounds good. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was, yeah, go ahead. I saw, no, no, go ahead. Feel free. Um, we we're talking about that. We're talking about my philosophy, but also cause I've done dance and movement and I was looking at this, um, picture I had bought of a choreography of movement. And it's a quote that really says about where I'm going and what I believe in. And it says, today I embrace my soul as we dance together upon currents of abandon, leaving graceful imprints from our blissful choreography. <laughs> which is the soul and be connected and wherever I go, I leave myself. You know, it's sort of like we all do that no matter what we do mm -hmm. in the soul and connected, we leave our imprint. And yeah. I think that's also like wanting to write this book, mm -hmm. leaving that imprint. Yeah, actually, yeah, I'm curious. So what is like, I could explain my feeling about wanting to write my autobiography and it's a well i won't explain i, I want to hear what you <laughs> so and I'll, I'll bounce off but um what is the feeling to to want to write your book how long you have you had it how would you describe it um i've always had this idea about publishing and i think even when jonathan like well i've had the idea like i first of all i never thought i could write I thought, gee, I wish I could write. So I started writing when he was a baby. And when I stopped, I would start writing again. But then when he started do, having, uh, being diagnosed, I wrote about that completely. And I still kept writing. 
And I think subconsciously, I must have known that I was going to write a book. I always felt I wanted to leave something, a legacy. Um, and it's been there. It's been hanging around. And um, I didn't know how or what I was going to do. And I think that working with Lee Harris in some of his programs and what I wanted to bring in, the creativity, it sort of had, had me explore. And I also, with the Mindfulness Self-Compassion course, using that as a therapeutic tool, I was able to move through some of still leftovers. I mean, we still I'll always still have that pain, but it's lessened. And um, I think it's sort of like, now it's almost like I want him to continue. I want people to see him as his gifts, that he continues and to help people who have been stuck. I know that there are people who are still, who are grieving. They don't know they're grieving and how to open the door. And if I help one person to open that door, then I've done what, I, what I've come to do. So it is, it's helping that one person to see that they can have what they want in their life. Yeah, well, that, that's a very uh, pure motivation from my, from my perspective. And uh, I think because it's so, so pure and simple that you'll definitely write the book. You know, I think our motivations can be convoluted. Certainly when we're younger, we want to be, uh, I don't know, the next Ernest Hemingway or whatever modern author next Stephen King or something. But um, yeah, yeah, I, I really think it's, you know, sometimes I consider writing a book and what I really feel like I'm doing is, is I'm doing a service to future generations. And on some level, maybe when I was younger, I felt, is that egotistical? If I said that to my friends, they would say, oh, you're so full of yourself. But think about it. You know, it's like right. Walt Whitman put his poetry in, and he really went through, I'm sure he went through a lot of crap to get those poems published. You know, Leaves of Grass, Walt Whitman's poems. And so many authors must have done that, especially when publishing was much more complicated than it is now. And I'm glad they did that because I get to learn from these, the wisdom of living a different life in a different time. So when I'm writing, I'm, I'm half writing for people who live way down the line, not, not people, I mean, contemporaries, of course, but, but for the, the future too, future generations. You know, there's so many points in human history when we don't actually, it's hard to know about. The 900s. What do you know right. about the 900s? You know, <laughs> wouldn't it be cool if we had a journal of someone who lived in the 900s that right. like, we knew what day to day life was? That would you be know? cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, so of course there's going to be plenty of information about this era, but um, but still, there, my perspective it can only be written by me, and and as Amy Levins right. can only be written by by you. Right. So it's worth it's worthwhile, and whether it's again like you said if it's one person that you really touch most likely it'll be a lot more but you know even if it is just one person it was a job well done and it was worthwhile and plus right. in your it's in your heart it's in your mission to do so right yeah so that's honoring your truth so so it'll at least help two people right you plus right. at least one other person absolutely yeah i've so learned a lot so far <laughs> mm-hmm so someone, a friend of mine jumped in and he said, uh, he, he's also a writer and a teacher. His name is Mike Amari. He says, the more we are exposed to a variety of faiths and belief systems, the more we find the core underpinnings are very similar. Mm. Sure. And then yeah. he says, writing, writing is time travel. Through writing, we could speak through ages. Oh, I like yeah. that. Yeah. Sure. You know, um, when... Yeah who uh, like when you read Shakespeare uh, I've seen some Shakespeare plays live in uh, the globe like the recreated globe theater mm -hmm. in, in London and when you when I saw it live I'm like wow this is so relatable it's just it's life the language is flowery and whatever but but it's just people in in their the complexities of human relationships you know yeah. um yeah so uh so just to add about how writing a book feels for me is like, it feels like uh, it's painful. It's that's how bad it is. You know, like 
I can't do it fast enough. And I, I'm doing it. I'm doing it. But, uh, you know, I, 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 you know, I've never given birth, but I've been a father for, <laughs> for, for two uh, births. And uh, I, I can only imagine how challenging it is, but I, I liken it to that. I've put out many albums. Mm -hmm. Whenever I do art, I put out a lot of albums and I have put out three books that are, well, four but uh, I never wrote a book of words with ideas and, you know, um, uh, what's, you know, um, prose. I haven't done that really. So it feels, it's torturous because it's just like going on and on and on and on. And when will it ever come out? It's still in me, you know? I don't know if you feel that level of like discomfort that you have to do it or not. I, I, it, there are days, there are days, but I'm, I sort of allow and trust that the alignment will take me to where I need to go when I write. Mm -hmm. And if I have a slow day, but it's like, it's going to come out at the timing when the timing is right. Yeah. And, it's so important to have that yeah. perspective. I mean, there are times I, I, the other day I was up at four 30 in the morning writing. Oh, yeah. so, well, yeah. it's also because I, <laughs> I love doing things. So if I get up at four 30 in the morning, I get this done and I do my meditation and I do some, you know, I do the writing in the morning and sometimes I do a meditate, a writing after my meditation and then I go play pickleball, something I'm learning now. So, <laughs> as I say, I like to learn. So that's great. What is pickleball? I don't, not sure I know the um, nuances. Yeah. Pickleball is in between is small tennis. It's a smaller court. It's on the tennis court, but it's smaller and it's a paddle like ping pong, but it's bigger. It's like this square. If I had it with me. It's in the car. And it's got a little handle like tennis and you play with a wiffle ball Really? and the court is a little lower. So it's better for people who are a little older. They don't have to run as much, and, but it's very quick. It's a quicker game than tennis. Okay. So almost uh, similar to badminton in the sense that you have a little more time. Uh, yeah. Well, no, not really. Because if you're, you're, here's the net. And you're here and it's going back and forth. It's like, oh, okay. So with a ball can go pretty fast. Right? Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. Or if you're back, you can really hit it, but, and there's some different rules, you know, like you can't step in the kitchen, which is next to the net. Oh. And it's hard. I used to play tennis and I just love the net and get right up there. So oh, really? mm -hmm. I had to learn. Ah, right. follow. You stepped in the kitchen. Wow. <laughs> That's fun. Yeah, it was. It is fun. It is very addictive. Anybody who starts it. Yeah. Hmm, pickleball. I just might have heard that a few, the word a few times. Yeah. Maybe and not. there's, it's basically started for people who are in their seniors and older, you know, mm -hmm. they're 55, 60, that range. But I'm taking some lessons and there are some young people in there. It's a whole new sport. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, young people also have, well, I don't know if I'm considered young anymore. I'm, I'm 40 now, but my knee is, is not doing good. I have yeah. a torn meniscus and wow. I'm reflecting on, I started physical therapy. I'm like, is it, is it, uh, is it Americans? Like, are we, we something up with us or, or is, is this just what happens to 40 year olds <laughs> across the globe? I don't know, <laughs> you know, but whatever, I'm going to figure no, out. No, I get to, that. Yeah. You know. Yeah. My body feels different at 40 for sure than it did uh, in my yep. 20s for sure. Mine even my 30s, feels you know? different now that I'm in my 60s. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. I can't. I used to go from one thing to the next and to the next and to the next. Like, oh, I'll go play pickleball. Oh, I'll go play tennis now. Or I'll go ride my bike right afterwards. No, it's like I'll do my weights that day. Or I'll ride my bike another day. But I can't keep going from one activity to the other. Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah, but it's it's, listening to the body. And that's one thing also that I do is the Nia technique is a mind body alignment and it's awareness. It's becoming aware of the body, hmm. being in so, tune to the body. Let me just get that Nia technique. That's another thing I'll put in the yep. notes there. Um, how do you use NIA? That? NIA. Okay. Yeah, I think I lost my thing here. Oh, show notes. Nia technique. Yeah. Okay, cool. So just to let you know what I'm going to put in the show notes, um, John Kabat-Zinn, uh, Brown Mindfulness Program, Mindfulness, Self-Compassion, Christine Neff, Chris Germer, Lee Harris, 
Kabbalah, Rick Hansen, Tara Brock, Mia Technique. Is there anything else you'd like to add? That's good. Let's see what else I got. My notes. I think that's good. You covered yeah, it really say, well. Thanks. Yeah. I'll just say like dis also, you know, discussed on this show and with links in case people want to okay. check it out. So um coming to bring towards my light the over a little bit more that's getting dark outside. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, June is my favorite. I'm so glad we still have a few more days of light increasing. Oh, I know. <laughs> Me too. Yeah. Uh, when, when I so I used to feel this year is a little different. Um, but I used to feel like June first, I was already like, it's like I was almost feel like the summer's over already by June first. I'm like, oh no. It's here, so it's going to end, know. you know, like looking forward to it is almost yeah. more fun. Um, so a couple more questions, if, if, if you have the yeah. time. All right. So uh, I think you discussed it, but maybe not. Uh, if you feel you did, we'll skip it. But what aspect of your life philosophy helps you to recover from setbacks? I know you've had different right. philosophy throughout life. Yes. I don't know what, what, what might the core be. Uh, if, if there is a core or what would it be now that that helps you recover from setbacks? I mean, my philosophy is knowing that I've gone through it before. I sort of look back and it's like, take a breath. I've done it before. Um, and I, what's coming up to me is family. Mm -hmm. Um, family, the support of my family is the most important thing for me. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where I get my support. I also do support myself in having a lot of resources. Right. You know, and um, if I need therapy or if I need chiropractor, if I, <laughs> I haven't had with that, but I do. And I think also it helps the setbacks is something that you enjoy and pleasure. I think it's really important to know of a, you know, Rick Hansen calls it refuge. I don't know if Lee Harris calls it, but what are the pleasures? You know, is it taking a walk in nature? Nature, I love nature um, and the ocean. That's actually, thinking about it now, I haven't had a setback since I've moved here in Rhode Island because I love where I live. I live five minute walk to the ocean. That's mm -hmm. where I go. I take a walk on the water, take a walk on the beach, and that's my refuge. I'm nature, and um, wow. And I do my meditation. I do, I do do that. But and journal. I think journaling um, has helped me a lot. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. Thank you. Um, I just want to mention that we got a few more comments. Just saying okay. that uh, about writing that writing can be an exercise in self-loathing for sure. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure how that came up, but we've done it with our junior high school after school program. They love it. Maybe uh, loathing was the wrong, maybe it was an accident <laughs> of typing, but yeah, this guy, uh, this friend, Mike uh, is yeah. an English teacher and with junior high school kids. And okay. so he, he does um, creative writing with them and they love it. So I, I imagine it's not self-loathing, <laughs> self-expression. Self self-expression. Self yeah, I mean. <laughs> Real comment. Hey, it could. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure self-loathing can come out of that too. But right, um, yep. Definitely. Uh, but, um, oh, oh, pickleball. Okay. Um, okay, so he was saying, oh, pickleball, they have a pickleball program in school. Oh, they there. do? Oh, that's great. Yeah. Um, yeah, and for the second comment. So for Mike, uh, if you're still there, uh, the self-loathing part, I'm just curious what, uh, what, what you meant by that. Um, and uh, so while he writes back, can you share three, up to three inspiring books, films or show, TV shows that you would um, recommend? Let's say someone's feeling like a little down. I don't yeah. know if it's the lockdown or whatever, they just want to be inspired. Uh, right. Well, the shows that really helped me, I don't know if it's Netflix, is the Gilmore Girls. That was something I vegged out on. I love 
Hallmark movies. I'm a sap for the Hallmark, but the book, Rick Hansen again, I don't mean to advertise for him, but um, Hardwiring Happiness is- Hardwiring Happiness. Yeah, great book that really helped me. That was when I was going for my, um, I got certified to teach mindfulness and with this fellow in California, Sean Fargo, and he mentioned this book and that really helped me to see the joy in something. And for example, and to, and to take it in. And so that if you're having a hard day, you know, where's one little tiny thing to take the joy. And I was at work in Boston and I was trying to bring in the light and motivate, but still wasn't happening. And there was traffic on my way and there was construction and there was a fellow coming off the highway and I let him in. He literally, I could feel his joy. He was so excited and <laughs> like waving his arms and oh my God, like he yeah. couldn't, it's like as if he won a million dollars. That's how it felt to me that he was mm -hmm. able to express that. So you never know when you do something, how it affects somebody. So since I was reading Hardwiring Happiness about taking in the joy, I took that in and mm -hmm. I'm, I'm still, I'm getting the chills from it. That was over two years ago. That's great. <laughs> so that's an example of his, his, of his book. So that was, that's, um, um, Hardwiring Happiness. And what's the author's name again? Rick Hanson. Rick, Rick Han Hanson. Hanson, H-A-N-S-O-N. Okay. All now, right. Of course, I had to bring out an expressive arts therapy book. Oh, okay. Um, Sean McNiff, um, Imagination and Action. Um, if you want to explore, it talks about desires. It talks about how to use expressive arts and in different emotions, the different emotions. And he actually was the one who started the Expressive Arts at Leslie. Okay, cool. And when I graduated from Leslie in 75, now you guys will figure out how old I am. <laughs> um, uh, he started the Expressive Arts Therapy Program and I said, someday I'm going back. Wow, interesting. And, um, and you did. I did, I <laughs> did. And I took, um, he did come to speak for a couple of the courses when I was there. So. Um, yeah, and I cool. did. So, Hardwiring Happiness by Rick Hansen, Imagination Action, yeah. Sean McNiff. Yeah, yeah. Um, any and, uh... um, Radical Acceptance mm -hmm. by Tara Brock. This talk, this is a really helpful one. I use her tools called, and I don't know if she developed the coin brain, which is recognize what's going on, allow investigate and then noting. So you go through the different states. So if you're really stressed, you sort of, okay, accept it. So the first thing is to accept what's going on. Accept what's happening. Okay, I'm stressed. And then you allow it. And then you invest, investigate, do some meditation. She takes you through this. And this is in her book. And it's, um, and she has some meditations in there as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Cool, there's some three, three good books. Yeah. Uh, any videos or anything like that? Anything else? Um, basically, Lee Harris, I'm on his portal. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I find it worth it. Um, yeah. I'm sure you do. It's There's a lot of different types of meditation, a lot of med information. And I do a lot of the mindfulness uh, programs. Let's see if there's any videos that's coming into mind. Um, no, because I'm a, I'm a learner. Mm -hmm. um, so we have us portal and uh, yeah. cool. I mean, I don't need to, yeah. I'm not to, no, but I'm trying to think of you, but if you have else, anything else, there's something else, but nothing's coming. Cool. I, I just want right to uh, acknowledge that. Um, so we got cleared up on the self-loathing about writing oh. thing. Yeah. So he says, as such as I love writing, as much as I love writing, I can also feel the worst about myself while writing as I doubt myself quite a lot. 
Yeah. Ah. Yeah. I could, I could relate to that. I remember when I kept journals, I kept journals throughout my life uh, since, I don't know, since I was like 13. And I actually threw, threw out a few years worth of journals, lots of them yeah. were bad because I felt there was just a little bit too much darkness there. I would go there, I'd get like a stomach ache, kind of like the self-loathing, like, like, because then it would bring up old stuff that I would be better off forgetting, you know, between people or whatever my yeah. opinions were or things that happened. And me releasing that, even though I do regret it sometimes, I want to know what happened in those years. Uh, I think that gave me space to write my book and really see the past from a more uh, mm -hmm. um, just present uh, moment thing instead of attached to those stories. And I do have many journals that were more lighthearted in nature or less story based, more different mm -hmm. energy, you know. Uh, and then what, what was good about me throwing out those journals, and uh, the point is, I, I could relate to the self loathing thing is that I forgot a lot of the stuff that happened there. And then in order for me to remember those years, I have to connect with my friends that I was spending time with at that era to remember it. So it's like, it's kind of forcing me, of course I could choose not to, but it's encouraging me to reach out to my, the people in my life. Mm. That was a great benefit of releasing yeah. that, all this stuff. Yeah. 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 So, well, you know, while he's talking, there's another book about writing. Mm -hmm. um, it's called writing the mind alive. And it's by Linda Metcalf, and it's about how to get into the depth. So if you're saying, oh, geez, I really feel this pain. What do I mean by pain? And then you keep going. And what happens is totally surprised by the end where you go, because yeah. it's, it's getting into further into depth. And that was something that I really, that helped with my writing. That was one of the things that I used a lot. Hmm. Cool. I put that book down too. And Haley Sage says that Tara Brock does such valuable work. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm familiar with Tara and I don't follow her particularly, but whenever I put a video on, I, I do feel moved, you know, I've no, yeah. nothing um, against, you know, she's a healer that I believe in basically. You yeah. Know, I think yeah. she's got a good vibe. Yeah. Well, she, yeah. And, and also uh, she does do great videos. I've watched hers and yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I like I like what she does. Yeah. So this has been wonderful. Uh, would you like it's been to tell fun. us? Yeah, it's been a lot of fun, Amy. And we went just a little bit over an hour, actually, because we started early too. So I don't know, close right. to an hour fifteen. Um, what are your plans in the upcoming several months? If you care to share, or I don't know, uh, is there anything? You sure, I'll have my book with? completely done by August. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no pressure. Yeah. No pressure. No. 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 Um, yeah, one day at a time. I enjoying the summer. I think, you know, just really having a good time this summer. And I'm really thinking planning and looking into working um, as a consultant somewhere in assisted living in this area. Mm -hmm. I'm going to wait until the fall to really look into that and see where I can work part time. Using expressive arts or using or just... the expressive arts, using mm -hmm. movement, expressive arts, or even working one on one with someone I did do actually that with a legacy with someone and I was able to talk to her about what she remembered and so I had typed it up and given it to the family and some of her art so now they have that as memory that's great so um yeah that's something I like to do and working on my book and yeah well keep keep uh yeah. keep me uh, tuned into what was going on absolutely with your book. and uh Maybe we'll have you back here uh, again. And, yeah, I know. I would life. love to. When you're saying what book would you like to do, I'd love to be able to say, hey. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, you got to show us your book. Um, yeah. All right. This has been excellent, uh, Amy. So thank you so much for being a part of Music Philosophy and More. Oh, you're welcome. Have, have a fantastic uh, week and, and June and uh, summer. Yeah. And uh, I will uh, speak to you before long. All right. You too. And thanks for having me. This is fun. Yeah, you, you were my first book group guest. So this is a very special moment here. Yeah. I appreciate it. I started all. All right, thanks. Thanks so much, Amy. Have yep, a good night. Bye.